Lock and Key has finally had an adaptation actually make it to viewers. The new Netflix series is now streaming, and I'm here to tell you how the streaming service nailed this adaptation, even though it wasn't 100% in its translation. I'm Chris Carr, and I want to talk to you about how the changes in Lock and Key made it even better. Oh, yeah. Before we dive in, I want to thank all of our supporters on Patreon, especially our super nerd sponsor of the day, Zachary Turner. Thanks to these heroes, we get to keep binging shows and chatting with y'all about them. If you want to pitch in, head on over to Patreon and see if a donation tier works for you. You'll get shout outs and stuff in return. And if you just want stuff, click that affiliate link to TeePublic. They've got merch to suit any and all fandoms. This video will obviously have some spoilers, guys, and while the beginning of this video will lightly pepper in a few, I will be giving you a huge honkin' warning when we talk about the end of season one. Sound good? Okay, then let's head to Key House. Episode one gives us the same story of the comic. A troubled young man named Sam Lesser murdered Rendell Locke. His wife, Nina, and their three children, Tyler, Kinsey, and Bodie, then moved to Rendell's childhood home key house in Massachusetts. Shortly after arriving, magical keys begin to call out to Bodie, and Bodie's convinced there's some magical echo in the well house, trapped in the well and speaking to Bodie about the wonder of these keys. The keys include the anywhere key, allowing the user to open a door and step through it into anywhere in the world, as long as they've seen the door they're trying to walk through the head key, which allows you to literally get inside your mind, and the ghost key, which turns the user into a sparkly Casper. You do leave behind a corpse, but you can float back into your body if you return through the ghost door. There are also new keys in the series, most notably the mirror key, which proves to be a sinister key that traps people in prisons of themselves. But what holds the story together when we aren't talking about magic is that same foundation that any good horror fantasy has, a solid one based on real emotions. The core here, like so many horror films, is a family dealing with grief and loss, and consequently, everything that comes from those feelings and their new surroundings. Each family member, aside from Bodie, feels responsible or guilty about Rendell's death. Tyler believes his father's murder is entirely his fault. Kinsey hates herself for not fighting back at Sam and instead hiding with her little brother. Nina is trying to handle her pain, her own demons, and still provide a loving home for all three children. You may have heard that this adaptation has been a long and arduous process. Many film and television adaptations have been attempted and then have prevailed. So this one finally making it to the screen is already a win. And in my opinion, the show is a real success. And that's because it's not a panel for panel 100% adaptation. Now, some of you may be having whiplash from some of my other comic to TV reviews. Sometimes a faithful adaptation works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes change is great, and sometimes it isn't. The boys became more interesting for me than the source material. Giving Hazel and Chacha backstories and faces in the Umbrella Academy demystified them for me and made them less effective and less terrifying. It's a subjective thing, and an age-old debate comic fans get into all the time. So why did the changes work in Lock and Key? By reworking, updating, and fleshing out the material, the Netflix series pays respect to the comics while forging its own path. And let's be clear, Writer Joe Hill was incredibly involved in this first season, and he and artist Gabriel Rodriguez even make cameos. But he and the showrunners weren't afraid to explore new roads for this story to take. For example, Nina serves as a sort of B-plot periphery character in the comics, and that made sense. As we cover extensively in the show, adults can't understand magic. They forget about it. In the comics, this is called the rifle rule, something set in place to keep adults from discovering the keys or abusing their powers. This idea of magic not being noticed by adults is a long-standing trope in fantasy. So now what's Nina's purpose? In the streaming series, Nina isn't just taking the kids to Key House for a fresh start. She needs to learn more about her husband. What could have made Sam want to kill him? And how do his old friends factor into his fate? I'm also pleased to report that unlike the assumed assault I described in my Lock and Key history video, there is no suggestion of Nina Locke being sexually assaulted. In fact, the character who did that to her in the comics, Al Grubb, is completely removed. This allows us to focus completely on Sam as the family's attacker. The show also makes the effective choice to have Nina bash him over the head, thus saving her family. The role of Rendell's childhood friend Ellie Whedon is expanded upon as well, giving us one heck of an ending for the first season. We'll talk about that more in our holy crap, this is a huge spoiler section, okay? There are other additions to the cast as well. Scott, with one T, is reworked and given a horror nerd posse known as the Savinis, a reference to the famed special effects and makeup artist. We're also given Gabe, another new kid in town, and Eden Hawkins, the mean girl of Matheson. 
Characters like Gabe and Eden will throw comic fans off from the events that took place in the pages, as they possess some traits and storylines that were held by other characters. There are also some changes that were made to things that could be construed as problematic now. In the comics, you have the skin and gender keys. One could change your ethnicity, the other your gender. These keys are instead replaced with the identity key, a key that is simply said to change your appearance. The town has also changed from Lovecraft to Matheson. Lovecraft's works had definitely influenced where the saga goes, and his influence on horror fiction as a whole can't be denied. But over time, more and more has been released about how racist Lovecraft was, leading many in the sci-fi horror community, especially authors, to re-examine their admiration of the author. So then why Matheson? Richard Matheson, first of all, appears to be free of controversy, at least at the time of this recording. He's best known for I Am Legend, episodes of The Twilight Zone, and wrote dozens of short stories, novels, and more. Now, before y'all go on thinking this was Netflix trying to just be PC, the change actually came from creator and writer Joe Hill himself. Hill wrote in a fan newsletter, quote, I've learned too much about Lovecraft in the time since I wrote those first issues to feel the same way about him. And the show seemed like a good opportunity to honor the work of another, different master of dark fantasy. So that's what we did. My idea. Don't blame the TV guys. Hill took his story from over 10 years ago and made appropriate changes, leading the Netflix series to feel like an alternative take on the comics and making it something that should appease fans and fresh to the story viewers alike. Do I miss some of the shocking gore and violence, especially from our main villain? You bet your sweet puppy I do. But we have a lot more to explore in the world of Lock and Key, and this is just the first season. We can build to some of that gore if they want to. We've certainly left off in an interesting place. Now here's your huge spoiler warning to turn back if you haven't seen through the end of Lock and Key. Stop here, come back to us. No worries, I don't wanna be blamed for ruining this for you. For those of you who have read the comics, you know that Ellie was stabbed by Dodge and that's how she dies. Also, they rip off part of her mouth. It is unsettling. In the Netflix adaptation though, we see a classic bait and switch doppelganger move come into play. As I mentioned, there's a key known as the identity key that can change the appearance of a person. Dodge uses this key on Ellie, forcing her to take on Dodge's female appearance, then knocks her out. Dodge places Ellie's body in Key House so that after Dodge sinks through the floor in her shadow form, the locked children will find Ellie, thinking it's Dodge, and take her prisoner instead. The siblings gather their friends to help them, and Kinsey suggests they lock Dodge away behind the Omega door. This whole idea had an incredibly ominous feel to it. Dodge has been wanting to open that door the whole time, and while locking them behind it isn't the outcome they've been fighting for, doesn't feel like the best solution to handling them. Gabe immediately agrees with Kinsey. The teens take Dodge to the drowning caves, open the door, and they toss in who they believe is Dodge. Ellie comes to as this is happening, begging Tyler not to throw her in, and tries holding on to him before eventually tumbling into the weird blue expanse that lies behind the black door. Bodhi will question if this was in fact Dodge the teens ditched, as he is the smartest member of Team Keeper of the Keys. Now we first watch this unfold, not knowing that Ellie has been put in Dodge's place. The kids think it's weird Dodge doesn't have the crown of shadows when they find them, but quickly dismiss the concern and move on. Dodge's pleas to Tyler seem a little odd, but hey, I mean, she doesn't want to be thrown into that weird blue stuff. No one gets hit by a demon bullet from beyond the Omega door. It's great, but that seems kind of convenient. Then all this is explained to us as Gabe bikes through Matheson. We get flashbacks of him using the identity key to shift from Gabe to female Dodge to Lucas. So Dodge just macking on everybody, kissing one sibling, going straight to the next. Gross. Gabe finally approaches Eden, who is uncharacteristically chowing down. It's then revealed that Eden was in fact hit by one of those blue lights and is now also possessed. This is honestly my only issue with the show. This is all stuff I was speculating with my friends with as we were watching. I thought Gabe was skeevy ever since the cafeteria scene. He agrees with all of Kinsey's terrible, impulsive, destructive plans. He likes when she's bad. I didn't trust him. I speculated that something was hinky with Dodge when kids found them on the foyer floor. While walking us through everything gave us a solid explanation and left it so that if there is no season two, we know it went down, I would have rather had those things revealed later. This made the final episode of the season feel more like a series finale. Then again, it obviously does leave room for more story. What was really effective here though, is that I had never heard of Gabe. I didn't know about Eden. I kept waiting for other characters to show up from the comics or turn into a demon or be infected. So these changes kept me on the edge of my seat. I'll take that over being completely aware of every twist and turn to come. 
Of course, this is just one gal's opinion on the series. What did you guys think of Netflix's Lock and Key? Let me know your hot takes in the comments below. Thanks again to everyone on Patreon, TeePublic, and those of you who just stumbled here and stuck around. For more videos, click to the left. See you, Space Cowboy.